You look at Luke chapter number 19, verse number 41 reads like this. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. And when he was, he beheld the city, which was supposed to be the city of Fish, Jerusalem, Salom, Shalom, to that city and looked over it. The Bible says he wept over it, cried when he looked over the condition of that city. And verse 42 says, and when he was, uh, well, I read verse says, says, if thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace. They were in the city of peace. Only belongs to you. But now they are hid from thine eyes. Now they are hid, very interesting, from on the team of the Golden State Warriors. And even those who are on the bench. You have people that are just that astute in athletics. They are knowledgeable, not just in a part, part of the, 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 the athletics, but they know everything. They know who the coach is. They know who's purchased. They know every team and, and who's getting ready to get recruited to that team and who's getting ready to leave that team. How many points this player's made since he's been a part of the team? How he didn't make that many part points when he was a part of another team? You have static. You have people that know music song there is to know about certain music artists. They know every Aretha Franklin song name. They know every Bobby Blue Bland song. They can tell you when he made it. God took the kingdom from you. But you were impatient, Saul, and you decided to make the sacrifice without me being there. And right after you made the sacrifice, Samuel shows up and said, what is this that you've done, Saul? You put yourself in the place of God. When you were small in your own eyes, you did well. But now that God has promoted you and made you king, you've gotten beside yourself. And just like you tried to take the place of God, God has taken the kingdom from you. And the Bible says Samuel wept bitterly because he loved Saul. He saw how gifted Saul was. He saw the ability and the potential that Saul had, but Saul had a problem with humbling himself. And that's enough, and Samuel, that, that just did it. Samuel went on and laid down and died. Saul cried and tried to conjure back up Samuel from there. And, and, and when we began to go to these other sources, besides the source, looking for the word of God, they will lead us astray. They were yesterday. A lady said, your husband, your husband is a Taurus, right? Your husband is a Taurus. Bishop Ron is a Taurus. And, and my wife tried to, I, I think they were in the, a, 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 say, some type of disaster closed the door. It said God closed the door of the ark. And only those souls who heeded the warning of the preacher were saved. But prior to that, his message went in one ear and out the other ear. But God said, no, don't you be disturbed over this because it's not you they're rejecting. It's me because I gave you the message to give them. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. So don't you lose any sleep because if you warn them and they don't turn, then their blood is on their hands. But if you refuse or cease to warn them, then their blood is on your hands. And then just like in the days of Noah, yes, it rained. And God said, well, you know what? I want to give him a chance. So he gives him an opportunity. He makes a whole new world. And then they started repeating the same thing. And they got started getting involved in homosexuality. Men started sleeping with men like he sleeps with a woman. Women started being attracted to women like they're attracted to men. And so God said, oh, here we go again. 
this time I'm going to destroy Sodom. I'm going to literally destroy Sodom. The word Sodomite came from the country, the town, the culture of Sodom in the days of Abraham and Lot. Sodom and Gomorrah. They were twin cities. They were filled with their own way, following the lust of their own hearts. They couldn't see that God created male and female. He did not create a third species. But they refused to retain this knowledge in their minds. They, they refused to see what God said. So Romans chapter 1 says God gave them up to let them see just how destructive following their own way was. And it wasn't God that destroyed them. He came that they might have life. It's the thief that comes to steal and kill. He comes to steal the word out of your heart. And you have sad to say many Christians, they don't really engage their word during the week. Can I tell you, most Christians, 80% of Christians in the body of Christ, the only time they engage their word is when they come to church on Sundays because most Christians don't go to Bible study on Wednesdays. They only come to church on Sundays and that's contingent upon it's not raining and not too hot outside. So they, you know, they have their own way. They have their own mindset. Yeah, well, God understands. Well, God understands. He says, remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. On the seventh day, God himself rested. So he's appointed a time for us to work during the week, but he also appointed a time during the week when we stop working and come to the house of the Lord so we can be refilled. You can't drive your same car on one tank of gas for 300 miles. No, after a while you run out of gas. Neither can you be strong as a Christian by coming to church only once a month or when you feel like it. Are you all tracking with me? Yeah. We need this anointing to see because the anointing to see is the anointing for dominion yeah. to dominate the restraining forces that's hindering your marriage, hindering your business, hindering your life, hindering your health, your mental health, and your physical health. Now, you got to understand, my sisters and my brothers, you must know enough about your edemptive rights because until you know enough, about what your redemptive rights are, you can't enjoy them. You must know enough about your redemptive rights. What are my benefits now that, that I've accepted Jesus Christ? The psalmist said, what can I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits? There are benefits in knowing God. Not knowing about God, but know God. I, I, I can say right now that I, I and, we, and, and we use this, this colloquium, or we use this verbiage when, when we say things like, well, I know the artist her, her, H-E-R. I know, or let's, put, 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 let's, let's, let's pick something easy. I know Aretha Franklin. I, I, I know Aretha Franklin. But, but really, you know of Aretha Franklin. You don't know Aretha Franklin. Because let's take somebody who's alive. I know, you could say, I know Anita Baker. Well, actually, you don't know Anita Baker. You know of Anita Baker. Because if we were to call Anita Baker right now and say, do you know Jane Doe? Anita Baker said, never heard of Jane Doe. So you know of Anita Baker, but Anita Baker doesn't know you or of you. So a lot of times we say, we know God, but to know somebody in the proper biblical context is to be intimate with them. To really know somebody, hear me now, is not to just have a platonic relationship or a casual relationship. To know somebody is not just to know them as an acquaintance or a colleague or a neighbor or an associate. But to know somebody from God's frame of reference is to be intimate, to have intimacy. And God is saying, I want you to have intimacy with me. I want you into me, you see. I want you to have intimate intimacy with me. The Bible says, and Adam knew Eve and brought forth the fruit of their firstborn. See, when you are intimate with God, you bear fruit. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. 
And so as men and women of God, we have to know what the benefits of knowing God is. There's benefits of knowing God, but you'll never know the benefits of knowing God if you are not all in with God. If you're not all in with God, you'll never understand the benefits of knowing God or enjoying your benefit rights. Now, hear this. What you see, you believe. Help me say what you see, you believe. Say it again. What I see, I believe. Now watch this. Stay with me. What you believe, hear this, provokes the hand of God. I said two different things. What you see, you believe. What you believe provokes the hand of God. I'll say it one more time. What you see, you believe. I may not believe what I heard. You may tell me something. I may have gotten it from a credible source. But I may have a trust problem with you, even though you're telling me the truth. There's something that happened in our past that makes me skeptical of what you say. I'm not going to take what you told me without, without going to get some research on it as Bible, because I know you tricked me in the past. I forgave you, but I'm not going to forget what you did. So before you did that, I would take your word as gospel. But now you... You jeopardize my trust in you. So when you tell me something now, believe me, I may look like I'm listening to you. And I am listening, but I do understand. I see I can't take what you're saying at face value because you duped me in the past. So I'm going to go and do the research myself to make sure what you're saying is credible because you lost credibility with me when you deceived me. So what I hear, I may not always believe. But let me see it myself. That takes the middleman out of it. What you see, what you see, not what you heard. What you see and to hear sometimes is to see. When you hear with an understanding. It's a thin line and it takes wisdom to discern what's being said. And wisdom is the ability to be able to differentiate between what's right or wrong. It gives you the ability to know what to do with knowledge. That's what wisdom is. The Bible says uh, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. But in all you're getting, it tells you what goes along with that wisdom. Get understanding. And so I may believe it, what you're telling me, because you think you're credible. But I may not think you as credible as you think you are. And forgive me, you can't, you can't knock me for not thinking that you are as credible as you think you are. That's my prerogative to not trust you the way you want me to trust you when you cause some distrust in my mind. So, and I can see, I can see because of my discernment that you have, you feel a certain kind of way because I'm saying this, so let's agree to disagree. No harm, no foul. Nothing between us but the atmosphere, right? Continue to believe that. I'm not upset. But allow me to be me and go do my research on what you're saying to me. And once you say, once I see what you're saying is credible, I'm going to check it out. And when I see what you said is credible, now I believe it totally. But I just can't take a part of what you're trying to convince me of because you told me something and say it's credible. I must, do, I must take the next step and research myself. I got to study to show myself approved. Not just what you're saying. I got to research it myself and find out it's credible before I believe it. So I may not believe what I hear, but I can believe what I see. Say what I see, I believe. Say and what I believe, Provokes the hand of God. Watch this. And the hand of God, woo, provokes supernatural speed. It provokes supernatural speed. Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. Read it when you get a chance. His prayer for the Ephesian church in Ephesians chapter 1. Read it when you get home. Verses 15 through 23. 
He read that God would open up their eyes. Let's look at, let's look at verse 18. Quickly put that on the screen. Ephesians 1, 18. Paul was praying for that church. He said, you have a form of godliness. You guys look sharp. You, you look like you believe in Jesus. But, 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 but what I'm seeing is different from what you're saying. So Paul says, I'm praying that you get the anointing to see. I'm praying that the eyes of your understanding, the eyes of your understanding. He's not praying right here for their physical eyes. Stevie Wonder couldn't see, but he had a book. You can't judge a book by its cover. So obviously he was talking about a different set of eyes. Stevie Wonder was blind. He wasn't talking about what you can physically see in that song. You can't judge a book by its cover, and you can't judge a love by the lover. In other words, don't look at, watch this, the container, but research the content. That's why he concluded you can't judge a book by its cover. Don't just look at the container, but look at the content. And so Paul is saying, you, you, you don't understand what I'm saying, that I, I'm praying that God opens your eyes. Uh, and, and he's the one that wrote to the, uh, uh, to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So you got to dig into it. And he wasn't just talking about when he said, for we walk by faith in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, and not by sight. Listen, he wasn't just talking about your physical sight. Here he was talking about the natural man. The natural trinity. The ego, the id, and the conscience. That's what Paul was making reference to. And to make it in layman terms, when he said we walk by faith and not by sight, he was talking about your five natural senses when he said not by sight. And if you study the word, you'll know what the author doesn't write. You assume the reader knows. When Paul said we walk by faith and not by sight, he was saying we don't walk by our natural senses. Yeah. You have a lot of Christians. They walk by their natural senses. You hear, the, you hear the saying, let your conscience be your guide. I mean, that's not always a wise saying. <laughs> let your conscience be your guide. Your conscience is the referee between your spirit and your flesh. And your conscience is like a cactus. When you get too close to something that's going to harm you, your conscience pricks you and tells you to get away from that. But a lot of us, our conscience has been seared. It's like when I started playing golf, when I first started playing golf in the first six months, I was out there every week and I developed, I, I developed what you call, what do you call those? Uh, no, they weren't calluses. Blisters, that's what they were. I wish they were calluses. I think you got to get the blister before the callus. Y'all kiss that tomorrow. You can't see what I'm saying over there. But, you know, but when I first started, I, I, I started swinging that club so re uh, repetitiously that I developed blisters, Brother Adi, on my hand. That's so much I had to stop playing for about a month. And then when I, I said, no, I got I to I I do something. So I, I put my glove on. And then I started playing with the glove on, and the blister turned into a callus so that I could tolerate putting that piece of metal in my hand and swinging that club. After a while, I got used to it. I didn't even think about a blister because my blisters had hardened. And now the club doesn't have the same effect on my hand that it had. The same thing is when you are not, when you don't have your mind renewed with the word of God, your conscience is not a good guide. Unless your conscience has been purged by the blood of Jesus. Because if your conscience has not been washed with the blood of Jesus, you still have that old man tendency even though you're born again. And after a while, if your soul is not anchored, you will drift away. Because your conscience does not convict you anymore. You have a lot of Christians that are going to be disappointed when the rapture comes. I pray for them daily that we see what God is saying so we can dominate that Adamic tendency to make us want to do our own thing opposed to what God said. We have the law of God because it helps us navigate and, and interact in life and lead us around traps. The word is a lamp unto our feet 
and a light unto our pathway. Jesus, the Bible says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. But our problem is a lot of us are not following his lead and wondering why our lives are messed up because we need the anointing to see. You can get so big-headed because God gifted you that you develop what I call a Lucifer syndrome. It's bad when God gifts you and you think you're bigger than the gifter. The Bible says if you exalt yourself, you're going to be abased. But if you humble yourself, you shall be exalted. And this is why it's so important that we understand this anointing to see is not talking about your natural eyes. And that's why some of you are on your fourth marriage now. You're judging the guy be of his physicality and not his spirituality. How can two walk together? Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Unless they're on the same page. Unless they're on the same page. You're religious, but you believe in Muhammad. I'm religious, but I believe in Jesus. But you're pretty. You're handsome. So let's get married. You're only going by your physical eyes. Oh, it's good why you don't have any babies. It's good when you first get married. You're still attracted to the sex and the money and the trips. Oh, man, yeah, it feeds the flesh. But when the baby is born, what school are we putting the baby in? Because we don't want the baby in public school. We're putting them in Life Christian Academy. No, we're not going to Christian. I'm Islam. I'm, I'm, I'm not a Christian. You knew that when you married me. You knew I was a Muslim when you married me. I knew you were a Christian when I married you. So our baby's not going to Life Christian Academy. Our baby's going to the school that, uh, 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 that uh, 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 Malcolm X has right there on, on Crenshaw Boulevard. And now you got friction in the marriage because you didn't collect the data before you got married. You, you weren't on the same page. Your eyes weren't open. Your spiritual eyes were darkened because of the lust of your flesh. And therefore, your conscience was seared because God tried to prick you. He told you what fellowship have light with darkness. How can two walk together except they agree? You, you read it. You heard it in the Bible. But your flesh, when you saw this man, when you saw this girl, it, begins, it began to go after that person and got distracted. And you end up got, 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 got entangled. And now you're going to divorce court. Married the guy making you making... $250,000 a year, a million dollars a year. He's making $50,000 a year. Parking cars at an exquisite hotel. But he was so handsome when you pulled up in your Jag and he parked the Jag and opened the door for you. Looked at your little pretty legs at your mini skirt that you only wear on Wednesdays. Because you sure don't wear them on Sundays. Not, not that anything's wrong with it. But you're a hypocrite. You know what a hypocrite is? Pretending to be something that you're not. Amen. I'm just trying to think about what you're thinking about right now. So all of a sudden you get involved with it because you're judging the book by its cover. You're looking at the container and not the content. I mean, when I got married, I never thought I'd like a light-skinned girl. The girls I was attracted to before I met Lady Levette were dark and lovely. My motto was the darker the berry, the sweeter the juice. I like dark-skinned women. I like skinny, dark-skinned women. They had a song that said, nobody wants the girl with the skinny legs. I said, I do. I like skinny, dark-skinned women, mother, when I, before I got even met Sister LeVette. My first girlfriend was a skinny, dark-skinned lady I met in summer school at Centennial High School. In 1972, the summers. In 1970, I went to summer school at Centennial High School in Compton. I was in a typing class, my business class. She would deliver the mail. She wasn't even in the class. But every day she walked through, I said, man, that's a pretty girl. She was skinny, but she was well put together. You ever heard of a little piece of leather? <laughs> well put together? This side just said, let me go over here. But I got attracted to that little skinny, dark-skinned girl, and I found out what her name was, and we got involved. She was my girlfriend for a whole year until, until. I heard about, I heard about Levette from my sisters. Yeah. They talked about this girl that was always in the front of the class that they couldn't stand. <laughs> I had never seen Lady Levette, 
But I heard from a credible source, at least I thought they were credible from my sisters, she thought she was something. She thought she was the teacher's pet. All of a sudden one day, I see this girl walking down the hall while I'm on my way to pick up my other girlfriend in between classes to take her to lunch. I get cut off by this girl in a mini dress carrying about five books in her hand walking like this. Please don't tell Sylvia that I said she walked like that. But that's the way it looked like she walked to me. And I said, well, I, you know, woo, 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 woo. And I kept observing her. And all of a sudden, after school one day, I saw her walking in the senior square of Centennial High School. And I was thinking out loud. Say, thinking out loud. Thinking out loud. I wasn't talking to anybody but myself. I said, there's that girl. And one guy said, oh, that's LaVette. I know her. You want to meet her, Ron Gibson? I was scared to say no. Because I looked like, like, I was like, like one of the players at the, co at the school. I said, yeah. And he introduced me to La Lady LaVette. We talked for about two hours. Then I stopped looking at the container of wanting light-skinned girls because since LeVette was very developed at 15, I like, wow, talking to you is like talking to my mama. <laughs> Brother Rick, my, my, my girlfriend that was skinny and, 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 and dark, she wasn't developed. Maybe she was developed, but that was it. I'm going to just leave that right there until we have a men's retreat. Anyway, so, but when I saw LaVette, she was totally a woman. And all of a sudden, I started talking to her. She was totally a woman, a developed woman. My other girlfriend was, she was still in the process of becoming. She was pressing toward the mark. And since LaVette was all over the mark, her cup running over. Anyway, nevertheless. You gotta stop trying to get me distracted. Or was that me getting distracted? And, and so, but we started talking. Watch this. That's why you, you, you gotta ask God for the anointing to see. I'm going by the physical. I like dark skinned, skinny girls before I, I met LeVette. And then after meeting LeVette, we talked for about two hours after school. And then I found out her mom was divorced and dad was divorced when my mom and dad were divorced. I found out who her aunts were. She found out who my uh, uh, aunts were. I found out about her uncles. She found out about, out about my uncles. I found out that her people, my people, lived on the same street on 111th Street off of Avalon. On 111th Street over there. And they grew up, my, my, my people rented her grandmother's house, Mother L.O. Hills, right on 111th off Avalon. And they lived across the street, my cousins and her cousins. Her, my cousin dated her uncle. It was a family affair. But I didn't get this with my dark-skinned, skinny girlfriend. She was smart and everything. I, I, I thought I loved her. I really thought I loved that girl. But when I met LaVette, she took it to another level. I mean, I could identify with her more than on an intellectual and a recreational level. I, I saw into her soul, and I found out she had, she had to go to church every Sunday. I had to go to church every Sunday. This other girl invited me to her church one time out of the whole year relationship. How can two walk together? Except they agree, except they have the same understanding, except they see eye to eye. You ever heard that term? Except they see eye to eye, except they are compatible, except they are evenly yoked, equally yoked. A yoke means you're brought together by a mutual agreement. Yeah. A mutual agreement. Yeah. Her people knew my people. We went to church. But some of you people that walk by your natural mind, your natural eyes, then you're looking at the container, but you're not looking at the content. And, and then you're not really taking in the understanding that your mind, in order to make right decisions, in order to have dominion in every area of your life, even in marriage, yes. you must have an anointing to see the person you're dating. Yes. Dating is not just taking somebody to dinner. Dating is not just going out with a girl because she's pretty. Dating is not just going out with a guy because he has a business and he's handsome and he graduated from school. Dating is going down into the inner sanctum of the soul of the person. And seeing do we have the same philosophy of life? Do we have the same worldview? How can I 
marry you when you are a Muslim and I am a Christian. Right there, there's a problem. Although you're nice, although you're, you're rich, although you're pretty, although you're, you're, you're feminine, uh, we still have a different worldview. And we can't live like that. And so what you see when God shows it to you, compare it, watch this now, with the source, with the doctrine of the word of God. That's what I call the source. With the foundation of what you're trying to build your life. If that foundation is not made of the same substance as your foundation, this foundation could be asphalt and yours could be cement, then that foundation not, may not be able to bear the weight or you may not be able to bear, or his foundation may not be able to bear the weight of what you're bringing to the table. And no other foundation can any man lay. I don't care what you think. Well, God understands uh, this, that, or the third. God understands why I don't go to church all the time. God understands this. Well, your yeah, God understands, but do you understand that God understands that what you understanding about him is wrong? Every Sunday they put the sign up five minutes. Where's my sign now? I'm ready to close. Say what you see, you believe. Say what you believe provokes the hand of God. Say in the hand of God provokes supernatural speed. But you got to be able to see it, watch this now, to believe it. And you got to be able to believe it to provoke the hand of God. And if you want the hand of God to provoke supernatural speed in every area of your life, then your eyes are going to have to be open to understand that he's the only one, watch this now, that charts your destiny. Yes. Ephesians 1.18, look what it says. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. It means understand why we, for example, do praise and worship. We don't do praise and worship just to hear skilled instruments and gifted singers. No, we do praise and worship to magnify the Lord. Yes. Well, how can you magnify the Lord? This is always my question when the scripture says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. To magnify means to enlarge. Yes. I can't make, you can't make, hear this, oh, magnify the Lord. Why do we do praise and worship? I'm just giving this as an example where our eyes need to be open. We don't just do praise and worship to entertain you. David said, magnify the Lord what? with me right so these people are not up here in real churches say real churches I'm not talking about churches that are are sideshows I'm talking about churches that are rightly dividing the word the Bible says before Solomon dedicated the temple that the priest couldn't even preach or speak because the anointing was so powerful in the praise and worship that the people couldn't even they couldn't even minister that's what it said because the praise and worship was so powerful. That tells me they understood the purpose of worship. But in this modern day church, this modern day church, where the ladies are up in skin tight pants, I mean pants look like rubber, doing praise and worship. The men just come in any kind of way, wear a hat and on the keyboards and a hat, sitting down playing their instruments. Even when I go to court and the judge mounts the bench, everybody stands up. But we become so lax, so lazy, so at ease in Zion that we don't even understand the purpose of praise and worship. A lot of praise and worship people only praise and worship their ability to praise and worship. They're not worshiping God. Look what I can do. Bishop Blake used to say, I love the song when they keep them normal and not hitting all those little curls. Like, oh, how great. No, just say how great thou art. How great. Just say how great thou art. Open up your understanding. We're not worshiping you. Lucifer, or Lucifina. 
You catch that tomorrow. You'll see that tomorrow. But we're worshiping God. Thou shalt worship the Lord God, thy God, and he only shalt thou worship. Thou shalt have no other icons. An icon is an impression of the real. An icon. If you took your fist and pressed it into your palm, take your fist out of your palm, you would see an impression of your fist in your palm. That's a reasonable facsimile of your palm. It's called an icon, something you made a God out of. Thou shalt have no other God, not even a praise and worship leader. That's why Satan got kicked out of heaven. He forgot the giver of the gift and got caught up in the gift. And so this is why it's so important, especially in this day and time. It's so important for the church. And I'm going to call a solemn shut-in, a three-day shut-in real soon. Listen, listen, listen. I'm going to call a solemn shut-in real soon. Because open your eyes and see what's happening in the world. Just, just ask God to open your eyes. I mean, you can see what color suit I have on. Every one of you can see what color suit I have on. And just like you can see what color suit, what color suit does this look like? Gray, right? Just like you can see what color suit, you can ask God to open your eyes so you can see the signs of the times. Just like you can see the color suit I have on. God will open your eyes so you can really see, get yourself off yourself and put yourself into Jesus. Get off of your high horse. Get off of your ego. Get out of your id. Get out. Ask God to soften your conscience. And the only way that can be done is that you have your, the eyes of your understanding enlightened by the Holy Spirit. I can tell a blind man the sky is blue all day. But unless God opens his eyes, he'll never see it. I can tell a blind man, Diane, that the sky is blue. He's blind. I can tell him the sky is blue all day. But unless the Lord opens his eyes, unless the Lord opens her eyes, I can't worry about that. Yeah. You don't want to see. Yeah. And so Paul prayed. This was his prayer for the church at Ephesus, like I'm praying for so many people around the world, that the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, that you may know, you may know my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, this time, time is not, time is not what life is all about. Time is just a part of life. There's a future expectation called the blessed hope. That you may know what is the hope of his calling in your life. Many are called, but few are chosen because everybody that's called doesn't answer. The word's going out to the entire world. I know when people call me now, I see their phone number. I don't know who it is. I don't answer. I don't know it's you, but I know it's a phone number. I didn't give it to nobody. <laughs> and I'm the type, I don't just give my phone number out. Because people call you with nonsense. Yes, yes, right. When you're a guy like me, they're calling you begging yes. or complaining yes. or criticizing yes. in, a very, in a very complimentary way. <laughs> Y'all see that tomorrow. Let me go talk this side. You just got, so I don't get my phone number out there. If you got my phone number, then you didn't get it from me. You can talk about me like, you give your phone number to whoever you want. Be like Sister Levette. I mean, be like people that give their phone number to anybody. Sister Levette gives her phone number to anybody. Her phone rings 24-7. I don't even look at it when it rings. I just happened to look at it last night. Because it was by my, I was sitting there reading the book. Her phone was right there. And I can't, I can't stand her ringtone. <laughs> So I picked it up to try to stop it. She got this Google phone. I have an iPhone. I didn't even know how to do it. I'd start pushing buttons, and the text came up. I said, it's for you. It's Ayana. I mean, I mean, yeah, you texted her yesterday, right? Yeah. I didn't mean to say that, but thinking out loud. And they had a conversation, and that was okay. She said, oh, yeah, well, that's, that's time. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, okay. But she gives her phone number out to everybody. Mm -hmm. I bet you don't have my phone number. Did I give it to you? I didn't, did I? But you have it. But if you call me and I don't know your number, I'm not going to ask you. I would say, text me when you can. I would hit text me when you can. But my, my, point, my point is this, that you may know who's calling you so you don't run after everybody who's calling you. 
Amen. And then when the right person's calling you, you answer. Yes, yes. Remember when Samuel was first being called to be a prophet? <laughs> when he was in the house of Eli, he heard a voice calling him. That was God calling him. But he couldn't differentiate between uh, Eli and God. Uh -huh, yes, yes. My sheep, what? No, my but you got to study to know his voice. Yeah. A mother can tell her baby in a room of a lot of babies. If her baby starts crying, her baby has a distinct voice. I don't care if the baby's in a room with a whole lot of babies, Brother Solomon. That mother will know that's her baby crying. And Jesus is saying, my sheep, my sheep. Not religious people, yes. not people who come to church, but my, those people who are intimate with me, who take this serious. Yes. Because after you're dead, there's no more hope. There's no more hope in the grave. Yes. You're going to still know that he called you, and you're going to wish he was calling you. Yes. But there's no hope in the grave. When that rich man died, he was still hoping that he can get out of the hell. He said, well, send somebody to have, have them dip their finger yes. in some water yes. and put it on my tongue because I'm tormented in these flames. Yes. Well, he knew about those flames before he died, but his money, his gold became his God. Yes. There's no hope in the grave. Once you're dead, you're still going to be conscious yes. because you have a soul. Yes. That's the eternal aspect of you. Yes. Just because your body dies, you're tripartite. Your spirit, soul, and body. Your body dies... And, 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 and it's going to the grave only to be resurrected. Even if you're not a Christian, your body is still going to be resurrected. You're going to be given a resurrected body. They don't preach like this anymore. That will endure eternity in hell forever. So even if you're not saved, there's going to be a resurrection of the unsaved. That's why the Bible says the sheep will be on one side and the goat will be on the goat's way on the other. If you die without God, if you die stuck on yourself, if you die with pride, pride go up before destruction, a haughty spirit before fall, you're going to hell. They don't preach like this anymore, but time is running out. Whenever I turn on the television and see nothing but homosexual commentators, I'm looking at MSNBC last night, Sister Pat. My wife in there cooking my dinner. I'm in there looking at TV. All of a sudden, I see a beautiful white lady, a beautiful black lady, and a black guy with braids oh, yeah. as commentators yeah. on the TV. Yeah. And they're talking about this Roe versus Wade. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so I wanted to hear their perspective on it. Yeah. And when the white lady started talking, the person had a deep voice. So I turned the TV up to 100 so my wife could hear in the kitchen. I say, am I hearing things? Because what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing are two different things. You can't always believe what you hear, but I believe what I see. That's true. That's true. I heard the voice of a man, but saw the face of a woman. I can't always believe what I hear, but I can believe what I see. I turned it up. I said, Levette. She said, yes, dear. I said, what does that voice sound like that you're hearing in the kitchen? Everybody said the anointing to see. This is really the anointing to understand. And she said, I said, she said, what do you mean? I said, does it sound like a woman or a man? I turned it up so she can hear it. She says, of course, that's a man. I said, okay, come here, come here. She came into the room where I was, and there it was, what appeared to be a woman in a man's, with a man's voice. As I said, well, wow. I, I said, LaVette, look, look, look at where it should be a mustache. You saw very faint, at least I saw. I had the anointing to see. I saw a faint impression of a mustache and a goat teeth that had been waxed or something. She had makeup on. Oh, no, we usually call them. Don't say it too fast, but it's a she it. You can't say it too fast. You know, black bow ass. You catch that tomorrow. What, what did you all just get lost? Because I said, don't say it too fast. She it. Don't say it too fast. And that ain't no bull. Okay, watch this. So I said, isn't that something? This, this is a, a trance, what do they call them? Trans, tr transsexual, transgender, whatever you don't know until you know, right? And they even told you, showed you, right? But if you don't know, you don't know, but you know that's not a man because you saw the lady's voice. Yeah. I mean, you saw the man's voice, but you see the lady's appearance. And then the next person was a black 
so-called looking lady. And that person started talking with a deep voice too. I said, I am fit to be tied. We are literally living in the last days. This is the reason why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And then you had the other guys talking about this parade. Pride parade had to be uh, canceled. They were talking about some pride parade that was supposed to have taken place in London and some terrorists, no, some, some, this, these guys went to this gay bar, maybe you read the news, and sh in Norway? It was in Norway, thank you, you read it. Last night, these guys, they called them terrorists, they went to this gay bar in Norway and shot, shot it up and killed a homosexual person. And so they didn't tell us on, on the bar on the screen that those were homosexual people. But when they started talking, you know, if I had a little five-year-old, they, they would think that's normal. They would think that's normal. And, and, and so I said, Lord, we're living in a time now where the rapture can take place any moment. And, and like the prophet said, the summer has ended and the harvest has passed, Joel said, and we're not saved. A lot of us, we come to church, but we're not saved. And, and I pity you because time is no comparison to eternity. And if you don't really get right, the rapture will take place. You may still get saved, but you're going to have to go through great tribulation. You think the jab of the shot for the COVID was something. When you have to take the mark of the beast, it's going to be mandatory and not optional. Right now, that shot is optional because they politicized the shot. But when the rapture takes place and those of you who are professed to be Christians and you're not all in with God, then that's like having a candle trying to tell people Jesus is the light. Or a match, not even a candle, holding a match up saying Jesus is the light of the world. But then, after hearing a message like this, you throw the match away, and now you get a candle. Not many people can still see. You can't lead many people out of darkness even with a candle. But now you keep hearing and hearing and hearing because what you hear, uh, what, 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 you, what you believe, what you, what you see, you, you believe, and what you believe provokes the hand of God. Now you start to believe this message. Maybe I better get right because what Pastor Ron is talking about is it, it, really happening. You know, and so now you put the mats down, you got a candle, and now you're seeing, you're getting more convicted by the Holy Spirit. Now your, your hard heart is being more softened because the word, the word is penetrating that, that hard heart. And now you put the mats down, you put the candle down, now you have a lantern. Now you're impacting people on your job. Because you stop going to happy hour on Fridays with everybody. Now you're just happy with Jesus. I still got to talk to this side. Y'all getting it, but you, this, this side, a lot of them asleep so I can talk to them. So, so now you put the lantern down, and all of a sudden, now God enlightens your mind like Paul was talking about. And now you have a floodlight. Whenever you go in, they feel the anointing of God. Because God has transformed your mind. He's transformed your lifestyle. He's transformed your thinking. Because as a man thinketh, so it's he. They ask you now, why don't you go or to happy hours with us because I found out that that's not conducive to this new enlightenment that I've received regarding my life. I'm not saying you're wrong, but as for me and my house, I, I don't want to tip myself to continue to drinking liquor because uh, it kind of obscures my understanding of the word. Uh, the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, which when I went to happy hour, I got drunk. And if I keep hanging around you, I read in my Bible that bad company corrupts good manners. And now I went to church and found out if I want to get out of that, 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 that compulsion of my flesh, I'm going to have to come out from among what I was involved in. Not saying you're wrong, but it's not right for me. Yeah. And that's why you got to be careful, pastors. And I'm closing with this. I only scratched the surface because there were three things I wanted to share with you. I'll do that at the 10 o'clock service. But you got to be careful, pastors, that are watching me and preachers and you that are here. Don't be so quick to jump on the bandwagon and condemn the verdict or the, the message that came from the Supreme Court of the United States by overturning Roe versus Wade. Oh, yeah. Don't be so quick uh, to judge because if you have a problem with this judgment, hear me as an anointed man of God. This is what we're here for. We're, we're a relevant church that's relatable. Okay, they hand it down from the Supreme Court to overturn the Roe versus Wade that went into action in 1973. Almost 50 years, okay? No more abortions, they're saying. Some of the states, once this federal law goes all over the United States of America, you're getting ready to see a turn of events. 
And I told you before it even happened, that it's getting ready to get dark in the world. And that's why we need God to open our eyes so we can see what time it is. Are you listening to me? One thing I will tell you, and we'll talk about it more, because I have a whole argument, a whole word on abortion. I have a whole message that God gave me that's biblically uh, 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 sound about abortion. I'm not thinking about it. I'm going by the Bible, rightly dividing, because who are you to say that it's your body and you're in med school? This is just one example. And I need you to listen to me as I close. Ask, everybody put your hand on your, on your head. Say, Father, open my eyes to see in Jesus' name. Look at me now. Your eyes are open. Who are you to say, because you're in medical school, you went, you're going to medical school, just envision what I'm saying, you're going to medical school, you meet a handsome gentleman, or you meet a handsome young lady in med school, so you all get together and decide that you're compatible and you're going to date, Christian or non-Christian, you meet, you're attracted to this opposite sex that's in the same protracted field of study, aspiring to be a doctor, and you all start dating. In the midst of dating, your passion for each other begins to intensify. You didn't plan to have sex. You just planned to go to a movie or go to the beach or, or just have a walk in the park. But all of a sudden, you got to talking. You've been talking for about seven weeks now, and you're totally passionate about each other. And you have sex that night. Just say, Christian or non-Christian, it can happen. It can happen. But having sex before marriage is not the unpardonable sin. Before you judge a Christian for fornicating, check yourself. Amen. What are you doing that I can't see? Right. Although she's pregnant, you can see her stomach. What are you doing that I can't see? Right. That's a sin. So my point is right here as we close. It's been time for me to close. All of a sudden, you decide you're in medical school, and I cannot successfully become a doctor pregnant. So you have this love to be a doctor, and this baby has thrown a roadblock in a way because you didn't take care of your business by using birth control. So you get pregnant. So whose fault is it that you got pregnant? Yours or the unborn fetus? I'm not asking for an answer because I'm going to teach a whole series on this, okay? Because just to help you that don't study your word, that leads to your own say, that think you know so much. I'll throw this out there. I just beg you who believes that a human being is not a human being until it's born. You have a lot of Christians who think that. So they condone pro-choice. Okay? But, but in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, when you get home, read it. Don't read it right now. But according to God's perspective, a human being is a human being before it's born. Amen. He told Jeremiah, before you were even formed, in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, before you were even formed, you got to have the eyes to see what God is saying. If you don't see what God is saying, you're going to lead to your own understanding and get political with it because the Democrats believe they're pro-choice, the Republicans are pro-life, and I'm independent. I don't know what to believe. And that's how people are. But Jesus came that we might have. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy, right? To kill. Abortion, to me, is to kill. Well, Pastor Ron, are you saying that there's absolutely no room for abortion? You'll see that when I do the series. I'm getting off track of what my message was. And I'm going to do a whole series of that. And that is not what I'm saying. But I'll tell you what I believe as I close. Well, what if she was raped, Pastor Ron? What if she had incest? Her uncle raped her when she was 12 years old. What if her daddy raped her when she was 12? Can't she get an abortion right there, Pastor Rod? Don't take my opinion. Get with the word. When I show you the word, ask God to give you the understanding to see what God is saying about it. Because the same Holy Spirit I have in me, you have in you. And he said, you don't need nobody to teach you. The spirit that's in you will teach you and give you understanding about what to do. But you'll never get that understanding if you are not anointed to see. Yes, Having eyes is simply understanding what God is saying. Yes. That's what it means. The anointing to see is to understand what God is saying. And not just hear it, but do it. That's what I'm saying. If a mother's life is in jeopardy, 
and having that baby will kill the mother? The Jewish nation believes that you abort the baby to save the life of their mother. If the mother's life is in jeopardy of giving birth to that child, the Jews believe that you save the mother and not the baby. And I think that's a wise decision because that mother may not be saved. But Jesus already took care of the redemption of babies who were born with, with, with Down syndrome and autistic and without a brain, but were still born. Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sin. Yeah. That's the original sin. Yeah. And Jesus' blood covers that baby. Yeah. So when that baby's born, they automatically go to heaven. Yeah. But you as an adult, you may not be saved. Yeah. And if that giving birth is going to kill you, if you die unsaved, you're going to hell. Yeah. That baby can be born without a brain, but Jesus already covered that baby. Yeah. When he took away the sin, she shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Jesus. He shall save his people from their sins, plural. Yeah. But behold, the Lamb of God that take away the sin, singular, yeah. means an original sin. Amen. You just have to ask God to open your eyes so you can see. But when you don't see, you have a lot of rebel rousers in the church that divides the church. Yeah. And cliques and factions form when preachers are preaching to itchy ears that, 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 that miracle money's coming your way. God's getting ready to give you a mansion with ankle-deep carpet. The soul that sent it, it shall die. So we'll be talking about that. So I'm just going to ask you as a wise pastor that God has given me a large platform to be careful before you open your mouth and condemn people who are getting abortions when you don't have all the facts. Just pray. It's praying time. It's praying time. Because whether you believe it or not, I truly believe the way the world is going yes. that Donald Trump, no. whether you like him or not, okay. may become president again. Okay. If they can't find a jury to convict him, he bought off one AG, why can't he buy off another one? Yeah. I say AG, Attorney General. What's his name? B B Barr? Barr. But you got to ask God to get the eyes to see. I know y'all so smart. That's why we're going to have a panel of learned people, Christian people, to come in, and we're going to have dialogue in our church on a Thursday night about these issues that are at hand. Give the Lord a hand praise this time to go. I, I just, wow. Did you, if you enjoyed this word, give the Lord an arousing applause. Help me say informative. Say something that makes you think. Hey Amen. Think on these things. God has given us information that will lead to revelation that will cause a revolution to take place in our lives, which could be the solution of a lot of the pollution that's in many of our lives. I want to encourage you. We're getting ready to go into a, a serious recession around the world. Around the world. This pandemic has really impeded the progress of our economy, of, 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 in, 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 it's, it's really put an embargo on, 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 on getting imports and exports of parts and cars and materials, not just in our nation, but all around. And the reason, there's a reason why gas is so high. You know, you study and read, you find out. But, but let me tell you, if you're in the body of Christ, my God shall supply what? All Say, I'm in the body of Christ. Say, I'm a child of God. My God shall supply what? It doesn't matter how high gas is, God is still on the throne. He doesn't want us to be wasteful, but he wants us to manage what he's given us. Amen? He wants us to be wise, right? And that's, that's what he wants us to do, be wise, wise stewards. Everybody's not going to be rich. Jesus said, the poor you will have what? Always. So you will have poor Christians. But I do believe is, I do believe God's highest wishes that we prosper. Yeah. Have, no, it doesn't say necessarily have a lot of money, but have control over whatever your circumstance is, yeah. that you can be content. Yeah. Yeah. And that's going to come with managerial skills yeah. and knowing how to manage what God has given you. I'm not the richest person in the world, but I manage what I, what I have. And I ask God for wisdom every day. Give me this day my daily bread. Bread means revelation knowledge to handle what I do. And that's what I do. I've matured since the way I've 
started. I'm not trying to perform by you. I'm rightly dividing the word so you can understand how to live a peaceful life. And it's getting dark. But God said, let the wheat and the tares grow up together, right? So stop judging people, start praying for people, and let your light shine. Telling people they're going to hell is not going to help them get saved. Just let your light shine. When they see God delivered you from homosexuality. Because the biggest move in the kingdom of God is coming in the LGBTQ community. The biggest revival is going to come with the LGBTQ community. Those are the ones who are going to start getting saved coming into the churches. Churches that understand that God loves them. And we're going to have to start showing love. Whether they're gay, had an abortion, or whatever, love is unconditional. And that's what we're going to be teaching. That's what I'm teaching about understanding. Because there's getting ready to be an influx of people coming into our ministry. You're, you're going to see transsexuals, bisexuals, trisexuals. You know what a trisexual is, right? They try anything. But that's okay, but God still loves them. What were you before you got saved? So God wants us, he wants to drench us in his love, give us an understanding about understanding people. And then God's going to help us win them into the kingdom of God. Lift your hands. It's my norm to pray. Always pray before we dismiss. Lift your hands and let us pray. And repeat after me. Say, Father God, I love you more than anything. And you are the best thing that ever happened to me. I thank you for that word that I received today. Say, the entrance of your word giveth light and makes prudent the simple. I lift my hands in total surrender and I give you permission, Lord, to search my heart. If there's anything in my life that's not pleasing in your sight, sins of omission by me being passive or sins of commission by me being permissive. I'm asking you, Lord, to forgive me and put my life back on track. I believe Jesus Christ died, that I might have life in abundance to the full, till it overflows. And I receive Jesus Christ into my heart as my Lord and Savior in a new and fresh way. Help me, Lord, to see what you're saying to me, that I might walk out my destiny from this day forward. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer. It is done. Clap your hands like you're on fire. Wow. I release the blessing of the Lord on your lives today that you won't stress. I release the anointing of ease that this be a beautiful day for you. In everything you do and everywhere you go, may God order your steps. And when you open your mouth, may he fill it. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout, I receive it. If you'd like to become a member of our church, will you please stand? But please know that we're still practicing the COVID protocols. So we're not going to ask you to come up front, but our beautiful ushers will have a decision card for you to sign. If you'd like to partner with us, I believe the anointing that's on me and the power of God and the ability of God and the authority of God that exudes through me are transferred onto you because we are partners. You are part of the body of Christ like I am. And when you decide to join our ministry, you partner with the culture of this house and what God has for us to do. And God is going to bless you to prosper and be in health, even as your knowledge of his word, like he's done with Pastor Ron, is released onto your life. If that's your disposition, will you stand at this time? Pastor Ron, I would like to join this church. If that's you, sir, if that's you, ma'am, ma stand right now. God bless you. Please tell somebody about our church. Tell somebody about Bible study on Wednesdays. Tell somebody that this is a church where they can come and hear the word of God in a very clear way that will benefit their lives. Our deacons are taking their places. Look at me, everybody. If you are not a tither, then you cannot be blessed by God to succeed in life. I'll say it to this side. If you are not a tither, you cannot be blessed by God. I don't care how much money you make. God says, shall a man rob God? Malachi 3 and 8. God, you know, robbing somebody is taking something. If I took your purse without your permission, I'm robbing you. I just took it and went. It does look better on her, though. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> if I took your purse, Mother Parker, and gave it to, to somebody else, without your permission, I'll be robbing you. God would have never said, shall a man rob God? 
He said, but you have robbed me. God would have never said we robbed him yes. if what he is saying we robbed him from didn't belong to him. Right. Yeah. He said, you robbed me. And the man asked the question, well, how did I rob you? He said, in tithes and offerings. Yeah. Now, your offering is up for you to decide what you're going to give. But that tithe belongs to God. Yeah. That tithe does not belong to you. And let me inform you about something. Whether you pay God your tithe or not, you won't enjoy it. Because God said the tithe is mine, and he's all-knowing, and it may be your, your, your water heater break up, your car break down, something happened in your body, but God said, you're not going to spend my tithe. You may think you're spending it because you're keeping it, but when you put it in your pocket, the Bible says, it's like putting money in pockets. With holes. That's exactly what it said, with holes in it. You may think you're getting away, but you're not going to get by. So I would encourage you in a very loving way to use wisdom and give God your tithe. I'm talking to musicians in this house. We can't be like the musicians in the word where the preacher didn't have to preach because the musicians were so anointed. If the, if, if the anointing is not on you because you're not a tither, then you're cursed. And God can't bless you if you're cursed. You curse yourself when you don't tithe. That's just simple common sense. But in this day and time, common sense is not that common. So the preacher has to explain this to people. If you want God to bless you, open the windows of heaven. What happened when the last time the windows of heaven were opened? Read Genesis 6. It rained. And if you tithe, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive. That's what tithing does. It makes sure even if your back looked like it's against the wall, like the children of Israel were at the Red Sea, God made a way out of no way. And God will make a way out of no way when you commit that tithe unto him. You're saying, all of my blessings come from the Lord. That's what you're saying. Your tithe doesn't bless me. I was wearing alligator shoes and tailor-made suits before I started pastoring. God bless Ron Gibson because I was faithful tithing before I started pastoring. And God has blessed me and I wisely managed the resources. So I want to encourage you to understand your tithes don't bless me. Your tithes didn't buy my Bentley. My tithes bought my Bentley. Are you understanding me? Your tithes didn't buy my Ferrari. My wisdom bought that Ferrari. Hallelujah. Your tithes didn't buy my mansion. My wisdom and my tithing bought my mansion and the other houses I own. Yes, I boast in the Lord. You do what I do, you will get the benefits that I get. And so I want to encourage you to watch me around the world. I, I, some of you tithe online, but some of you don't tithe online. But you watch this service every Sunday. Multitudes of you, multitudes of you watch me teach every week around the world and don't give one red cent into this ministry to help us propagate the gospel on the mission field and around the world. I want to encourage you. To, it's on your screen. You can call the operators. They'll receive your credit card. And, or you can go to lifechurchriverside.org and sow online right now. The rest of you, if you're tithing today, make your checks payable to Life Church. If, if you want to use your credit card, our Deacon Clayton is to my left. Raise your hand, Deacon Clayton. You can see him and all of your contributions are tax deductible. Don't be a person who refuses to tithe. Your eyes are totally dull and dim. You're cursing yourself. God bless you. Love you. Coming back tonight, we're going to hear our own brother John Watley is preaching tonight, and we want you all. No. <laughs> it's not happening. I'm just prophesying. It's going, it's going to happen one Sunday night. Amen. Deacon's supposed to preach too. Amen. One Sunday, we're going to hear the deacon's preach. All minds clear? Have a wonderful day. Did you enjoy that word for real? Amen. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. I believe your struggles are over. Say, my struggles are over. Say, my struggles are over. God has opened my eyes that I might see. Father, I release a corporate anointing on this house. Every family that's represented here, every person that represents a family, I send your word to heal that family, to watch over them today. Send your angels before them, even before they get in their car. Free the highways and the freeways that they may have safe passage. Whatever they're doing today, Lord, let it be lovely. Let it be wonderful. And I thank you for those who are giving today. Lord, whatever barriers that are in their way, whatever they're facing right now, because they're putting you first. You said if we put you first, everything we need shall be added. Let this be a day of turnaround. Let this be a day of turnaround for your people. These blessings I ask in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. You're in the hands of our beautiful ushers, and they're going to direct you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your liberality and your generosity. Coming back tonight at 6 o'clock, Bible study this Wednesday at 12 noon and 7 p.m. Have a wonderful day, y'all. Love you so much. God bless you.
outside. Your two years gonna be in the sanctuary. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, man. Okay.